Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. This the second Sunday in Advent in which we, and I'm doing this because I forgot to talk to the ushers. I'm just making sure. In which we light this candle and this candle. Just in case. Uh, the second Sunday of Advent, also known as the Repentance Sunday. That's the main theme of today. Uh, great theologian, Pope Vincent. Actually, Coach Vince Lombardi. He used to say that winning isn't a sometime thing. It's an all the time thing. A greater theologian, Jesus, lets us know that repentance isn't a sometime thing, it's an all-the-time thing. In fact, that was actually the impetus for what we call the Reformation. This idea that repentance is an all-the-time thing. It's a change, yes, a change from selfish to selfless, but it's a change of heart and mind and life that come from knowing our situation before God as sinners and His rescue of us through His Son. That's the kind of repentance God's Word has for us. And that's what we pray for for today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll sing our first song. <clears throat>
Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God stands forever. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. of sin and unbelief are shattered by the light of the gospel. The prophecy candle gives us the first flicker of hope as we watch for the coming of the Lord. Be on guard, be alert, you do not know when that time will come. The Bethlehem candle calls us to repent. See in Jesus the light of the world. Change your hearts so that you may live as children of the light. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him.
May the light of these candles call to mind the glorious light of the gospel shining in the birth of our Savior. May his grace enlighten our lives both now and forever. Our scripture reading for this day is written for us in Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 13. And here's the encouragement of repentance. Repentance, yes, changing from our sinful ways to God's holy ways, something that he can only do for us. But he says it also shows that our repentance shows in repentant living. And the specific thing he says about us means that now we can live in peace and unity with our fellow Christians that we can be accepting and put them first instead of always going with what my preference and my comfort level is, putting other people first in love is a way to show that repentance, no matter how weird they might seem to be. Romans chapter 15. Indeed, whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that through patient endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we would have hope. And may God, the source of patient endurance and encouragement, grant that you agree with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that with one mind, in one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For this reason, accept one another, as Christ also accepted you to the glory of God. For I'm saying that Christ became a servant of those who are circumcised for the sake of God's truth, to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. He also did this so that the Gentiles would glorify God for this mercy, as it is written, for this reason I will praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. And again it says, rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples give him praise. And again, Isaiah says, there will be a root of Jesse, and he is the one who will rise up to rule the Gentiles. On him the Gentiles will place their hope. <clears throat> now may the God of hope fill you with complete joy and peace as you continue to believe so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is God's word. Also God's word, our psalm for the day, which is the sixth of the seven penitential psalms. Starting to see a, a theme in today's service. It's a, a, a prayer that takes us from the very bottom, the pit of doom and guilt, to the highest peak of perfect hope and assurance that comes only in this thing called repentance. It's a two-part thing. Recognition of my guilt and sinfulness and recognition also of God's love shown for me in saving me. Here, Psalm 130, if you read it, it's like a shortened version of the book of Romans, but written about a thousand years before it. And it starts out with a very personal confession. By the time you get done, you see that we're all in it together. It's a celebration of God's congregation of believers. Psalm 130. <laughs> I 
wait for the Lord, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. <clears throat> Glory be <clears throat> to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Remember your mercy, O Lord. Remember your mercy and love. Alleluia, alleluia. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. All mankind will see God's salvation. Alleluia. gospel lesson for this day is written for us in the third chapter of St. Matthew's gospel. And here we see the baptizer getting people ready for Jesus. The only way people can be ready for Jesus. Again, repentance. Repentance. Not that shows itself in, in lifeless forms, going through the, the forms of doing good deeds so people know how good we are or so that God will like us better so he won't punish us more. But the true repentance of recognizing humbly our sinfulness before God and then recognizing its only cure, Jesus and what he's done for us. And that is the only motivation then to want to serve him and each other. Matthew chapter three, the first 12 verses. In those days, John the Baptist appeared preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. Yes, this is he of whom this was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all of Judea, and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for his baptism, he said to them, you offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not think of saying to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for, from Abraham from these stones. Already the ax is ready to strike the root of the trees. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize with water for repentance. But the one who comes after me is mightier than I. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He will gather his weed into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the gospel of our Lord.
grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, the Christmas cards have started to pour in. Have you started to see them? Not quite as many of those old-fashioned Christmas letters, the longer letters written out, and I'm kind of glad. Now, don't take me wrong. It's not because I don't like to keep up with friends and old friends and relatives and find out what they're doing and where they're at in life. It's just got... Well, I don't know. Merry Christmas from the Johnson family. It's been another great year for us. Rich is so great at his job that the CEO just came in on his hands and knees and begged him to take over control of the entire company. And of course, Junie, you heard about, if you read the papers, of the way she rescued those toddlers from that flaming school bus and, and drove off the armed uh, terrorists with her mace and her little stun gun. And so we, yeah, we had to take a little vacation to come down from that, the week in Machu Picchu and another week in Tahiti. But don't worry about the kids because they're not missing out on anything. Really, their schools need them more than they need the schools because the kids are just so smart. Uh, the, the, little, little Jane, oh, she, after cheerleader practice after school, she works in the school office and, and they're already having her develop the curriculum and, and integrate it into the entire school system of the entire state. And, 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 Oh, oh yeah, the Johnny, well, yeah, he doesn't always make it to class, but he knows more than any of his teachers, and he is on the top five runners for the Call of Duty, uh, those tournaments where, where they win for playing these computer games, and, and yeah, Elizabeth, for being only six years old, can that girl hit the ball? And scouts from all over the world come when we have these under six tournaments. And good thing we have 12 years to decide which of the universities we're going to take up on their full ride scholarship. And well, it probably won't take her 12 years. I can see her skipping grades because she already, she already colors better and talks better than anybody else in kindergarten. And the twins, well, the twins, you know, they're going to go to preschool next year unless I have to homeschool them. Because after teaching our, you know, we have a Persian cat and they taught the Persian cat Farsi, and, and now they're teaching him Urdu. But the big thing is they, they won this, this tap dance competition, and I think that Steven Spielberg wants to make a movie on their lives. And I can't imagine who else could play them but them. And, and, and maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you know what I'm talking about and why I don't like it? Well, why do I hate it so much? Is it because that these people are so much about them and their accomplishments and achievements? Or is it because I am comparing myself with them and feeling a little left behind that maybe I don't get the opportunities and the accolades of the Johnson family and, and maybe people are kind of um, overlooking or at least minimizing some of my greatness. You see where I'm going with this? Either way, on either side, isn't it an issue of pride? And isn't it a problem of pride? And I do mean a problem of pride. Pride's a sin, a sin that we can very easily see in other people. I can tell who the proud and prideful and arrogant are just like that. I can, I can almost read it in their face before I even start to talk to them. But myself, when that prideful sin starts sliding into my own heart, I don't always notice that. And why? It's not such an objective thing, is it, when we talk about pride and sinful pride? Unless we listen to the way that our God talks about it and the way that our God deals with this as sin. Because for a sin that, I'm guessing most people wouldn't rank it on the top 10 list of the worst sins in the world. For some reason, if you listen to God and you read his holy scriptures, he keeps putting it as the very top one on the list over and over and over again. Maybe it has something to do with it flying in the face of his first and greatest commandment of having no other gods, and of course none of us would have another god other than him, or other than anything else that we put more confidence or more trust or more delight or more of our pride. Do you see where I'm going with this? God counts pridefulness as sin, and, and he speaks in very, very harsh terms about it that he is the only God and he's not going to give any of his glory or any of his credit to anyone or anything else. And in our pride, that sounds kind of selfish until we realize that God not wanting to give any of his glory and credit away is because only his glory and only his credit could 
save any of us. And that's what makes pride get in the way of such a dangerous thing. C.S. Lewis called pride the essential evil, the utmost vice, and said that the other sins of unchastity and anger and drunkenness and greed and the like are just mere flea bites in comparison. It was, after all, pride that made the devil the devil. It's pride that leads to every other vice, and pride is a completely anti-God state of mind. Now, God doesn't sugarcoat it as much as I just did. As he talks about it, for example, here in our Holy Word for, in his Holy Word for today, in Daniel chapter 4, verses 19 through 37, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was horrified for a moment. His thoughts troubled him. The king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream and its meaning trouble you. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream were about your enemies and its meaning about your foes. The tree which you saw grew and became strong. Its height reached to heaven, and it was visible to the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit was abundant. On it there was food for all. The wild animals lived under it, and the birds of the air lived in its branches. You are the tree, your majesty, for you have grown and you have become great. Your greatness has increased and reached to heaven. Your dominion reaches to the ends of the earth. And you, your majesty, saw a watcher who was a holy one coming down from heaven. And he said, chop down the tree and destroy it. However, leave the stump with its roots in the ground with an iron and bronze band around it. Let it be with the grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew from the sky. Its place will be with the wild animals until seven times pass over it. This is the interpretation, your majesty. It is a decree of the Most High that has come upon my Lord the King. You will be driven away from humans, and your dwelling will be with the wild animals. You will have to eat plants as bulls do, and you will be wet with dew from the sky. Seven times will pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdoms of men and he gives them to whomever he wishes. Because they said to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will remain yours when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, let my advice be pleasing to you. Break away from your sins with righteousness and from your guilty deeds by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps your prosperity will be extended. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on top of the palace of his kingdom in Babylon. The king said, isn't this the great Babylon that I built for a royal residence by my mighty power and my majestic glory? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice came down from heaven. It said, it is announced to you, King Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom has been taken away from you. You will be driven away from humans and your dwelling will be with the wild animals. Grass will be fed to you as grass is fed to bulls and seven times will pass over until you know that the Most High rules the kingdoms of men and he gives them to whomever he wishes. Immediately, the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven away from humans. So he ate grass as bulls do, and his body was wet with the dew from the sky until his hair grew long like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. At the end of the set time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. So I blessed the Most High, and I praised and glorified the one who lives forever because his dominion is an eternal dominion and his kingdom lasts forever and ever. All of the inhabitants of the earth are considered to be nothing and he does as he wishes with the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. So there is no one who can hold back the hand of the Most High and say to him, what have you done? At that time, my reason returned to me and my splendor and glory returned to me for the honor of my kingdom. So my advisors and nobles looked for me. I was reinstated over my kingdom, and I became even more majestic than I was before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven because all his works are true 
and his ways are just. All those who walk in arrogance, he is able to humble. Wow, and this is from King Nebuchadnezzar's point of view. It's even written in the Aramaic of the heathen nations around, not the Hebrew that we usually see the Old Testament scriptures written in. But still, it's God, the Holy Spirit, making sure that this king's story is incorporated into the story of God's story, which is probably why I didn't see any of you shocked to see these great miraculous changes happen in King Nebuchadnezzar. We almost expected it from this God. Even though this king was as powerful and as proud as you could possibly imagine. And he probably had most, the most right to brag of anybody. This was a man who had accomplished an awful lot. He had taken over the Babylonian Empire and consolidated it and completely got rid of the dominant Assyrian Empire that was on the scene before and made this the biggest, most powerful empire that had ever been around. In fact, its capital city was considered the capital city of the world. He had undertaken huge building projects, things that in his day were considered the wonders of the world. And some of them haven't even been able to be even come close to be duplicated since. He had just left the Egyptians' powerful army in ruins. He had conquered Judea, wiped out completely the city of Jerusalem, Historians and archaeologists alike will, will all together agree on putting him at the very top of the totem pole back then. Only God seemingly isn't as impressed as the in historians and the archaeologists. God is nowhere near as impressed with Nebuchadnezzar as Nebuchadnezzar is. Oh, he started out easy on him. He fired a little warning shot across the bow the first time. In chapter 2, he had given him a vision that showed how his kingdom, his empire was not going to last. And neither were the next three after it, but they were going to be precursors of the one kingdom that God was going to radically establish that was going to last forever and ever. And at that time, Nebuchadnezzar listened to that word of God. And he praised God and he gave him the credit and he told all the other people in his kingdom to praise God and give him the credit, but that had gotten kind of dimmer and dimmer over time as Nebuchadnezzar thought less and less of God's word and God's ways, he started to think more and more of his own words and his own ways. And he started thinking so much about himself that he forgot about God. But see, God does not stay ignored. God makes a way of presenting himself, even to people who don't believe in him. And he comes back with, again, something that seems like kind of little thing. It's a dream, a dream that bo really bothered this powerful ruler. But it wasn't just a dream. He also sent his prophet Daniel with God's word. God's word, the one and only thing that can actually tell people who the real God is, what he's like, what he's all about, what he wants, and what he does for us. So here comes God's prophet with God's word explaining this troubling dream. Yeah, there's a huge, beautiful, well-renowned tree. It's useful. It's beneficial. It is mighty. Everybody in the world knows about this Nebuchadnezzar. And yet, it was going to be taken away. Because what Nebuchadnezzar did not realize is his power did not come from him. It had come from God. And the God who gave him the power could just as easily have taken it away. And after God was done using Nebuchadnezzar for his purposes to be that axe, yeah, that chopped down all those other populations and empires that refused to give God his glory, that in their sinful pride thought it was about them and not about God, now the axe that God had been using got a little too big for its britches. And God said, I'm going to cut down your tree as well. But not permanently. At least not yet. Because this is where this dream kind of gets a little weird. As he goes on, an angel announced, So let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him live with the animals among the planets of the earth, with the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let him be given the mind of an animal, till seven times pass by for him. Now you wouldn't think that would require that much explanation, that all the wise men in his kingdom could not explain this to him, but that just goes to show how blind and how ignorant worldly thinking is 
and how it can even begin to grasp the true wisdom of God's truth. As God has just used this Nebuchadnezzar to chop down even his own, his own chosen people. He's chopped down that tree from David's dynasty. The great King David's dynasty is no more. It's cut down like a tree by the lumberjacks and instead of taking that as a warning, Nebuchadnezzar is going to bring this on himself. Daniel gets it. He pleads with him. Please, king, please, your majesty, just repent. Just recognize your position under God. Recognize who this God is. Just please repent. He goes on to say, break away from your sins with righteousness and from your guilty deeds by showing mercy to the poor. Kind of giving us a little lesson here on what this command of God is all about, this repentance thing that if you have that first commandment repentance that shows you know your position under God and what he can do for you, what's going to happen? You're going to start keeping that second greatest commandment too, that one of loving people and putting people, other people, ahead of yourself and humbly serving God by serving other people. Now this call to repentance, as you saw, didn't go over that big with Nebuchadnezzar. He just kind of blew it off and let it go by. And it did go by for like a year, 12 full months. And kind of like many people when God demonstrates his mercy and patience, I think Nebuchadnezzar was getting the idea that this was somehow a sign that it was going to be okay that there aren't going to be any consequences for what he'd done, that God's not going to follow through on any of his threats. But then all of a sudden, when he least expects it, what happens, right? He's up there on the palace roof where he can see all of Grand Babylon. And what does he say? Look what I have done. Look what these hands have made. And before his sentence is even completed, his nightmare comes true. God's threats are carried out and instantly, not only does he lose his kingdom and his power and his glory, he completely loses his mind. He loses his sanity. He's like an animal. He is literally given the mind of an ox. So he goes out and lives and eats grass in the fields. Here's this one, this great sovereign ruler who was glorifying himself and now about all he can do literally is glorify the grass. And yet, still, it wasn't over. As this merciful God comes and gives him even another chance, wakes him up, gives this, this opportunity to repent again, and apparently Nebuchadnezzar learned his lesson. He repented, he acknowledged, he glorified, he praised God, proving that he wasn't insane anymore, right? Because whether or not anyone can, prove, can pass any kind of a psychological exam or whether they eat alfalfa like the cows or not, it is insane to arrogantly put yourself in the way of God's plans, to get and think that what you want and what you think is more important than the Almighty God. Anyway, Nebuchadnezzar repented, and now what happens? God restored him. He restored his kingdom. He restored his glory. He restored his mind. And all of this, as you can probably guess, is an introduction to another humiliation, an even bigger humiliation. No, not even the tree of David's dynasty cut down. Yes, God did do that in judgment because the Israelites, he says he cut it down for their sins of pride, their arrogance. And it wasn't this, that was the part that I'm talking about. The other part is God's promise where he said even though that tree was cut off, David's dynasty was a dead stump, there was a little branch that was going to grow out of that. A shoot that would come up from that dead stump and that's where the real story of humiliation comes in. Another king. A king who came from the very highest heights to the very lowest depths. A king who could have stood not on top of the palace of Babylon, but could have stood on top of all of creation and said, look what my hands have done, and he would have been right. And if you didn't guess all right, I'm talking about the king who's God's own son. And he did humiliate himself voluntarily coming down here, setting aside his comforts, his pleasures of heaven, coming down here to live with the beasts of the field. Okay, maybe he didn't eat grass out with the cows, but what was his first bassinet? A food box for animals to eat out of? And it didn't get any better after that as he grew into a man. He grew into a perfect man, a perfect man who very humbly submitted 
A perfect man who humbly submitted to all God's laws and all God's wills, who perfectly submitted even to society's laws. And then, and then he went and says he did something really humble. Even lower than that, the Son of God, become a human being, took the blame for all our sins of arrogance and pride. Every time we put ourselves ahead of God by not following his will, every time we let our comforts and our preferences make us selfish in front of other people, for all those sins, Jesus took the blame of everyone's guilt and went to the very lowest humiliation of death, a criminal's death, a worst criminal's worst death. The blame for everyone's sins in the sight of God, punished by the holy, righteous justice of God. As he carried our sins and guilt, he didn't deserve it. He didn't do it because he deserved it. He did it because we deserved it. And his humble life and his humiliating death did something amazing. Put us back together with the real king of the universe. Put us back together with the almighty God as our heavenly father. As Jesus' humble life and humiliating death not only canceled out the penalty of our sins so we don't have to go to hell. It also supplied us with Jesus' perfect righteousness that makes God see us as perfectly righteous and makes us want to and be able to do things and say things and think things like, like the hymn writer in that beautiful Lenten hymn who says, My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. And you know how much better it is if someone else praises you than if you have to praise yourself? Here's what the Almighty God did. He did that exact same thing. He praises you so highly by connecting you with his son. He sees you as perfect as he sees his one and only son, Jesus. How amazing is that? With this repentance that humbly recognizes God's godness and our situation under that, and then God takes us and raises us up higher than we could possibly raise ourselves. What a humbling thought. What an awesome Savior God. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to God's holy word, would you now please stand as we join together in the Apostles' Creed. <coughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat>
whose very glance brings healing and salvation, cause your face to shine on us all. We are like sheep who do not know how to make our way through the hidden perils and dangerous places of this world. We seek your guiding and gladly follow where you lead. Help us to know and believe that when we trust our knowledge, our judgment, our skills, we go astray quickly. We forget the goal and lose our direction. We become increasingly confused until at the dead end, we no longer even sense how lost we are. So lead us like a gentle shepherd. Guide us step by step and bring us safely home. Out of the likes of us, you grow a people to possess your kingdom and to provide humanity with echoes of your will and your way. Make your kingdom come among us and through it, let, us, let it reach, through us, let it reach every corner of this sphere on which we live until everyone knows of your kingship. Your coming into our hearts and lives creates hope and strength and goodness in us. Provide your blessing that these grow and bear full fruit and nurture your royal reign within us and through us. With the imminence of your coming, we take heart for a new time and a new world are drawing near. You establish a new kingdom in us and among us. To you, our shepherd king, be all honor and glory and obedience. It is in your name that only we can pray this. And it is in your name we join in praying the prayer you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. <clears throat>